Hello everyone, welcome to the Geek Nighter podcast. I am your host Kevin Leapte and today we are going to talk about another very interesting topic. As developers, we write a lot of code, but we read more code, right? Because we review our own code, we review other, uh, other people's code and, you know, by reading code, I don't mean like literally reading, but we have to review it and how to make those review process effective as a team, as an individual. That's what we are going to cover today. To, to do that, I have Curtis with me. So Curtis has launched uh, this course called Mastering the Code Review. And uh, it has some great testimonials out there. I have So I always wanted to do this uh, episode about code reviewing as a process because I've seen this that there's no standard process or there's like different process uh, in different companies and different teams. And sometimes it gets a little awkward in the code review because it takes a lot of time. There's a lot of back and forth uh, because people uh, usually miss out on certain uh, like review process and certain comments are not very respectful or, you know, it goes a little uh, on the, on the bad side. So to do that, uh, Curtis is here to, you know, share his experience on how uh, the code review should be designed, should be approached and how it can be more effective as a team. So welcome, Curtis. Uh, Thanks. I'm really happy that I reached out to you on LinkedIn. So I was just randomly searching on code reviews and I got, you know, uh, uh, a testimonial from one of his uh, clients and I, I read a lot of good things about the codes and that's how I reached Curtis and uh, I just asked him, uh, you know, let's do this episode and, uh, you know, here we are. So let's see how it goes. So welcome, Curtis, to the episode. I'm really excited to have you. Let's start with a brief introduction for our viewers. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks a lot, KV. I really appreciate you having me on the podcast. I like everything that you're doing with it. Um, and thanks for reaching out. This was uh, this is a little bit of serendipity, a great um, opportunity to uh, showcase what I know and talk with you um, yeah. about this topic that I'm passionate about, code review. Um, so yeah, a little bit about myself. I'm Curtis. I'm a freelance software engineer. been a freelancer for about one year. Before that, I was a software engineer at Amazon Web Services for about six years. Um, just to kind of tell the story in terms of code reviews, I came into Amazon as an intern and then as a full-time employee. And, you know, I would open up a code review. We called them code reviews at Amazon. Um, uh, they're kind of like pull requests that, that many developers know and love. Yeah. Um, I would open up a code review, you know, get a lot of comments on it. Um, get like 50 or so comments on it and then open up another revision, get like 30 comments on that. And then kind of just, you know, I, I was very, um, you know, the, the feedback was front kind and friendly and my men and my mentors were helpful, but uh, it was kind of a struggle period that I'm sure like a lot yeah. of developers have a similar story and, you know, growing throughout Amazon, um, learned, uh, not only how to open up code reviews and author code, um, more effectively so that it would be approved and I could ship faster. But also I learned how to review other people's code um, and then establish processes for my team. And uh, just for fun, um, I like to share some statistics around like uh, the code that I wrote at Amazon. I wrote around like 550 code reviews and uh, also reviewed about 850. And I also took down production twice. <laughs> so um uh, at Amazon, we have uh, we have to write these correction of error documents, which is basically a post mortem document saying, "Oh, yeah, I took down production. These are the lessons learned. These are the corrective actions." So, kind of a rite of passage as a developer. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I see there is a lot of experience there. You know, in terms of code reviews, you have done enough mistakes. You have learned from your mentors, and you know. Uh, so yeah, that that sounds really great. Uh, uh, so I wanted to ask you, you know, how did you come up with this course? Like, uh, how did you think that, you know, this course is the right way to reach out to the people and, you know, convey your message that, okay, this is the right way to do code reviews. And uh, these there are some steps or, you know, these are the things that you should avoid. So how did you come up with this idea? Yeah. So about one year ago, I left AWS to be a freelancer and this gave me more control over my time and my project choices. And I had been writing on the internet, like in the form of blog posts and tweets and um, articles, those kinds of things. And I wrote a lot about code reviews and I talked about the experience that I had that I mentioned of like getting a lot of comments and 
I talked about how to review code and, and these posts always did better than others. Um, I talked about a lot, broad range of topics of software engineering. Um, these yeah. posts did better than others. They got more engagement, more people read them. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I got people asking me questions about how they review code and, and it kind of gave me some insight into, okay, I had this problem, um, as a developer, as a junior developer, and as I learned and grew my experience. So other people have this same problem, right? Yeah. And, um, it's an important one to learn, um, because many companies have some kind of code review process. They have some kind of process where you open up a pull request or a code review, at Google, they call it a CL. At, at Facebook, they call it a diff. You know, open source is a PR. Um, GitLab, yeah. it's a merge request. You know, we're all familiar with this thing. Yeah. Um, and many companies do it, but nobody really talks about it, right? Um, nobody really gives training to other developers about, you know, how do you give a good code review? What kind of things do you, what kinds of things do you look for? How do you mm -hmm. give comments and feedback to somebody in an empathic and clear way? Um, and at the same time, when you author some code and you get some feedback, how do you take that in stride? How do you listen? How do you respond? How do you defend yourself in certain situations? And these are, um, you know, these are, some of them are technical skills, but a lot of them are social skills and soft skills, mm -hmm. which are very important in software engineering, as you can imagine. Um, you know, communicating between teammates effectively plays a huge impact in the quality of your software and you know the the customers that are satisfied with the end product. Um, so I realized that not a whole lot of people were talking about this, and that's what kind of led me to uh, create the course. I launched Master the Code Review earlier this year, um, and kind of I, I'm I'm kind of uh, I like building in public and learning in public and sharing things. Um, so there have been about 900 students so far. Um, and about 30 companies have chosen to purchase the team license, which gives their company access to the product um, for their for their developers. Um, yeah, that's impressive. Yeah, great, great. Uh, yeah, thanks for you know sharing the background about you know why did you come up with this course, and it's it's very interesting and impressive uh, because a lot of developers, uh, as you say, 950 uh, developers have taken this course. Uh, so yeah, I mean. Definitely, they, they found it very insightful and uh, a lot of value there. So what what is your target audience? Like who should take uh, your, your course? Um, so I originally, when I was starting to create the course, I was targeting junior developers. I had junior developers in mind. But as I started, um, you know, sharing a lot of the content in the forms of tweets and articles and videos, yeah. I got a lot of feedback from higher level engineers, like senior staff, principal level engineers, just kind of telling me, hey, like, this isn't just for junior developers. It's for because a lot of senior people um, don't understand how to give feedback in an empathic way um, mm -hmm. that uh, positively motivates um, junior yeah. or mid level engineers. So um, that kind of like I restructured the content. So now it's pretty much for all all levels of developers, right? Whether you're junior, whether you're mid-level, whether you're senior, you know, you'll get value out of the course. Um, and uh, who is it not for? It's probably not for people who, who are learning how to code. Like if you've never, um, you know, coded, uh, written software professionally um, at a company, then probably not for you. If you are like a, a director, a technical director, um, uh, or just like way above the, scene, the the staff level or principal level engineer, it's probably not for you either. But you know that range of developers. And I should mention it's not um, it's not too uh, tied to a particular tech stack or framework or language. Yeah. Um, it's pretty much a, a generalized course for all kinds of developers. Awesome, very cool, very cool. And I, I believe that you know I also believe that you know in uh, the overall team process itself can be impacted with a good code review process and you know it, it can help uh, the team build a good culture a good team health in in the long run so uh, in this episode we are going to talk about uh, you know how to be a more effective in in code review process how does it compare with you know pair programming how to make code reviews faster and work for you basically as a team as an individual and at the end we are also going to cover some of the examples of you know, good 
average and bad code review comments that you know we we typically see in a in a in a company so great let let's start uh, diving deep into you know the code review process at the team level so in your experience as a as a team uh, i think so uh, most of the people are working in a team let's say small to medium sized team let's say 5 to 10 people nowadays i've seen a lot smaller teams let's say 4 or 5 people so as a team how should we approach a code review process and what what in your experience has worked and not worked yeah that's a great uh question i think um a lot of t- a lot of teams um don't put a lot of thought into this they think okay pull request everyone does these in open source so people should know how to do them but um i've seen a lot of teams that don't focus on uh creating a a process for the team to follow and the process should be um rigid enough so that people can operate within it you know they should just be able to read some docs and then operate within it but it should also be um loose or flexible enough to the point that people can you know it doesn't get in the way of people's work right um and so as a team a good way to uh establish your code review process and and make it better is to not only add documentation but also do a lot of work outside of the code review process to make sure that code reviews are um uh not negligible but you don't want a whole lot of activity happening within the code review um yeah because you know discussion thread long discussion threads or disagreements can go on and on and then the code is blocked for that period of time so i like to explain this um in kind of a sense of think about the discussions that happen in code reviews right so one aspect of them is objective the other aspect is subje- subjective the objective traits of those discussions are around uh flaws right or uh like maybe there's an exception that somebody caught like while reading the code or maybe there is a defect or a side effect that they're going to be causing it in some other part of the system well you want to do the work of like outside of code review make sure that you have a uh, good test coverage make sure that mm-hmm. you have continuous integration that's checking the code before it goes to production make sure that your pull requests automatically like when you open up a pull request in github maybe you run some tests um to make sure that everything is passing um you want to include automated formatters and linters so that reviewers aren't talking about dis- styling discussions there should be no discussion on style um and so you want to take care of a lot of those objective aspects of the process and kind of like eliminate them as much as possible now like tests yeah. and and those sorts of things aren't going to catch everything but um you should definitely like have those in place now the other aspect of code reviews so that was objective right then there's subjective yeah. aspects that's like okay um this code this uh this function is too long or this function is too small or um uh, mm-hmm. we should rename this variable or we should uh create an abstraction in in this way because the current abstraction abstraction is too complex right yeah um so those are those types of subjective discussions as well and you cannot it'll be impossible to eliminate those entirely um because you know we're human beings we have different opinions on things but you want sure. to kind of get your team aligned and going in the right direction so that those dis- to minimize some of those discussions so for example you want to um create abstractions in the code base you want to establish paradigms like maybe you write a lot of the interfaces and how the different modules and components connect together um yeah. and also and so that's one aspect is like the actual technical aspect of get your components down how do they interact so that mm-hmm. other engineers can just dive into the code and kind of like follow the paradigms that you've established within the code and get yeah. to work the other aspect is documenting your team stance on some of the subjective um topics right um so some of so some subjective topics like very popular debates among programmers right it's like okay should functions be small or should functions be large right um and then don't repeat yourself dry is another subjective opinion that people have okay do we dry up everything to the point where we don't want to repeat ourselves at all or are we okay with code duplications 
So yeah. things like this. So maybe documenting within your teams, it doesn't have to be, it could be in like the GitHub repo, the repository or your team's internal wiki saying, this is our stance on these subjective topics. And if we're writing code and contributing code to this code base, these, this is our, um, these are the uh, trade-offs. These are the right trade-offs that we should make, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. So those are some aspects of how teams should approach the objectivity and subjectivity of code reviews. Then there's the aspect of just setting expectations, right? So for code review authors, we should set the expectations that authors should include certain things within the pull request. Maybe there, maybe you should have a description of what the change is and why the change is being made. Maybe you should include screenshots. Maybe it should have a certain test coverage. Um, and PR templates work great for this. So setting the expectation for the author and also setting the expectation for the reviewer. So the reviewer, you want to set the expectation of, okay, if you're a reviewer, you need to make a clear approval decision. Um, yeah. And if you're going to nitpick, nitpick in this way. Um, if you're going to make a suggestion, then have some, have some background around your suggestion and include a reason why. So just kind of principles yeah. like this to set expectations for how authors should author code and how reviewers should review code. I know that was one of those like uh, long-winded answers, but um, yeah. No, I think uh, you added a lot of you know, interesting um, details to your answer with some examples, right? So I, I really like the, you know, having like a, uh, like a format or like a convention for your team, like, okay, this is how we do, this is how we, you know, write uh, subjective comments, and this is the team's, um, you know, idea of doing this. And it takes time because let's say it's a new team, they are still trying to figure out what works, works for them. So it might take time, but eventually the idea is to, you know, reach that level where you know what is subjectively correct for a team, what is not, and uh, adding context uh, like by the author or by the reviewer helps a lot because also I've seen this in my experience. If, if I, as a reviewer, I don't have context, I, I, I cannot, you know, effectively do the code review. Right. And the author's responsibility is to add that context so that reviewers don't go into, you know, a different direction because they, they are missing some context. Right. And there are like in real, real world, uh, experience, uh, people, Sometimes we have these deadlines, we have to make some hacks just to make it faster, fix some bugs. So if you don't have that context, reviewer, reviewers might not be, you know, uh, like n might not know about this uh, deadline and they might go into all the nitpicks and so it slows down the process. So it takes time and adding context adds a lot of value. So uh, I think that that makes a lot of sense for, for a team to follow. Yep. Uh, so I think, yeah, team process wise, it's clear. Uh, for an individual, let's say I, I see a PR pull request, how do I approach a code review? Like what is a, is there a pattern? Is there a checklist that I, sh I should follow? How, how does it work? Yeah, so um, when you're a reviewer, like when I was actually in my early career, I would author some code and then I would get reviewers commenting back and I didn't, yeah. but, the, and then I would, I wouldn't understand how they kind of got to that conclusion or how they got to the comments that they did. Um, yeah. And so to clarify the specific thought process, it's pretty granular. And I think experienced code reviewers um, kind of do this automatically and kind of without thinking, but to a junior engineer who isn't used to reviewing code, sometimes it can be difficult yeah. to actually think through that thought process and go step-by-step. Step, okay. Mm -hmm. What should I do? What should I look for? How should I comment? Um, so I've yeah. done some um, writing on this on my Medium and Twitter and those kinds of things. And I basically, I boil it down to a series of steps. Um, at a high level, you want to kind of get the context first, right? Um, you you have this pull request, you're looking at it, you want to get the context around the change. Ideally, it should be within the description, but maybe there are some issues or, um, you know, external sources. Of, you want to get details about, the task at hand, right? You want to get the context about the problem that the code aims to solve. And what, because the objective here is to seek first to understand, then to be understood. So this is a principle that I learned um, from pretty popular books, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and it applies to code reviews um, 
significantly um, on the reviewer side. Right. Um, so you can't, in order to um, find flaws and find readability gaps in a code review, you have to first understand the code change that was being made. And to do that, you have to first understand the problem. So get the context. Yeah. Um, determine whether or not the code solves the problem at hand. Um, then, so that's before you even start reading the code itself, right? Then you start diving into the code and you have to think about, okay, where do I start? And most pull requests should be small. That's like one of the um, guiding principles you should have in the team level code review guidelines, right? Code reviews should be small yeah, uh, because they're easier to review. Uh, but sometimes that doesn't always happen. Sometimes they can span a few hundred lines or a thousand lines or whatever. So as a code reviewer, what I like to do is kind of look for the critical piece of implementation. Maybe it's a heavy refactoring like, or it's, um, you know, a new API file, something where the, where the core of the change is being made, then kind of um, start there and then really try to get an understanding of the code. And in order to do that, you have to kind of like, uh, you know, like I said, experienced code reviewers do this automatically, but you kind of have to jump around, right? You have to follow function calls um, and, uh, maybe you have to read existing code to understand what it's doing in order to really understand mm -hmm. the change that's being made. Um, you, you might end, the, end up reading the same class or function like three or four or five times to actually understand it. Um, and you kind of have to read through the code in a code review with a little bit of skepticism because if you think about it, when you're reading existing code, um, existing production code, you can kind of take it at face value. It's running in production, so you know it works. You more or less, you know it's you know it's not it's not breaking things. Um, but when a code review, that code hasn't um, proven itself, so it doesn't. You don't know if it works or not. So you kind of have to be a skeptic, saying, "Hmm, I think there's a flaw hidden within this code. Like I'm, I'm going to have to read this carefully and try to find it." Um, and this doesn't necessarily mean that you don't trust your teammate. It just means that. Um, you know, humans make mistakes. Um, software development is very hard. It's very hard to push code out without defects. Yeah. So um, just kind of proof rate, proofreading and reading with that skeptic mindset in order to find those bugs. Um, then only after I've like read through the entire thing, then I'll go class by class, module by module and kind of compare the implementation and maybe the unit tests as well, just to make sure everything is tested and all the edge cases and corner cases are covered. So I'm reading through, you know, I'm reading through this code review the code in the code review many, many times. Um, and also yeah. writing comments as you go. Um, a lot of times um, the comments might be wrong. So let's say you're reading through a particular function and then you discover something like, oh, they missed this edge case. So then you write a comment, oh, you missed this yeah. edge case. And then you go and you read another function and realize that that edge case is accounted for or maybe like does, isn't applicable. So maybe you have to go back and delete mm -hmm. that comment. So it's kind of an iterative process of like writing comments as you go. And as you get more and more understanding, then you kind of go back and refine those comments. Um, and I talk about, you know, I talk about commenting a lot as well. Um, with, with commenting, you want to make sure you give a reason why you want to make sure you have a good path forward. You want to make sure you're clear and empathic. Um, so I know that was another long winded answer, but <laughs> that's kind of the thought process. No, I think, it, I think it is it is really important, you know, to follow a structured process because I also remember when I was a junior developer, uh, I simply couldn't understand the change. Like, what is happening here? Because I would just read, like, file as it is, like, uh, in, in sequence, and then I, I wouldn't understand, like, what is happening. But the idea that you shared, you know, I, I kind of follow the similar pattern, like, understanding the context first. And it's author's responsibility to add enough context you know, in plain text, just to give you an idea without reading the code. So you don't end up spending a lot of time just getting the right. context, right? And if let's say there is no context added by the author, I think it's totally okay to, you know, ask for the context, just, you know, uh, comment on the PR or uh, maybe just have like an offline discussion uh, and, you know, get the context first. I think that helps a lot and it has also helped me. And then having this structured approach and, you know, commenting uh, as you go and, you know, also coming back to it if it doesn't make sense and deleting it or editing it, yeah, that is also uh, like, a, like a good thing to do. Uh, so I think this checklist makes a lot of sense. 
And I also personally see that, you know, when there is a PR up, I have to review it. It takes sometimes a lot of time to do this, like code review properly, yep. right? So uh, does code reviewing actually slows down the process or how, how do you look at it? How, what do you think might make the code review process itself a little bit faster? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and I think one thing that a lot of people do, including developers and managers, those sorts of yeah. things, is they underestimate the time it takes to perform a code review. Um, performing a code review is a very difficult, challenging thing to do. And it takes a yeah. lot of time because, like I said, you have to understand the change. You have to read the code over and over again to, um, to really understand it, right? And does it slow down the process? So as opposed to not having a code review process at all, I would argue that, yes, it does slow down the shipping time, but in the long, so that's in the short term, but in the long term, um, it leads to less yeah. defects and um, more readable code. So um, poorly written code is very difficult to maintain. It's very difficult to build on top of, um, and it kind of slows down your team's ability to, um, you know, add features to it, right? And if yeah. you have defects, if your team is constantly fixing defects, f fixing bugs, those sorts of things, those are also very expensive. Yeah. And so in the, long t in the long run, it can really slow the team down. So you're kind of making that trade off of, okay, in the short term, we're going to make sure that we have quality code that works and is readable. But in the long term, we're going to save a lot of time because we'll have less defects and less um, operational burden. And those sorts of things are very difficult to detect. I think um, when the book Clean Code was written, I think um, there were, uh, it, it, you know, the, the book kind of talks about um, the different ways you can make your code more readable. But at the very beginning, it also talks about the cost of having unreadable code where you, as a developer, you're yeah. just reading, like if you have some convoluted logic, you're just reading and reading and reading. And nobody really understands how expensive that is, right? Um, and that yeah. that is very, it is very, very expensive. And it's very difficult to measure because you can't go inside a developer's brain and kind of measure, okay, how long did you spend reading this code? So it's very difficult to um, see those kinds of things. Um, so yeah, in the short term, so yeah. uh, in the short term, um, yes, it slows down the process a little bit. In the long term, saves you time in the form of reduced defects and re more readable code. Totally, I, I absolutely agree with that. You know, it's not measurable how much cost you are paying if you don't do code reviews. So we can't really compare. Right. Like this is the cost for if we do code reviews versus not doing code reviews. So. I, I believe that code reviews is a must uh, and, you know, uh, following a specific guideline and best practices, I think it will help also to not slow you down by a lot, you know, uh, so I think it makes sense. Let's talk a bit about, you know, the common mistakes that you have seen uh, in your experience when it comes to code reviews. So on the author side, it might be not providing enough context, um, not uh, you know, there are general code coding principles that I see a lot, which might be kind of out of scope for a code review sense. Um, but as an author, you want to yeah. make sure that you, you know, you're clear about the context about, around the change and also the why you want to sell the problem. Like yeah. many other things in software engineering, like if you want to work on something, if you want to open up a pull request, if you want to, um, you know, design a, a solution or a system, you want to sell the problem, Right. Uh, really emphasizing why the change is needed or why you made the decisions that you did. Um, so that's a yeah. common mistake on the author side. On the reviewer side, um, common mistake. Uh, there are, I think there are a lot of common mistakes on the reviewer side. Um, uh, I guess a few of them would be, you know, not taking code review seriously. Might be, like maybe just saying, looks good to me. looks good to me. Just like not reviewing the code at all. I think that's very common. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, just, just right. I mean, that's, <laughs> you're playing a dangerous game when you do that. I mean, um, you know, <laughs> uh, and also, um, common mistake for reviewers, not, um, make, not making the rate trade off of like speed versus quality. And this is kind of going from a context perspective. Like if you're a reviewer, you should gather context. You should understand whether the author is going for speed, like maybe this is an urgent fix that they need to get out right away, 
or maybe they're going for quality, right? Yeah. Maybe this is something that, you know, the, the due date is like two weeks in the future. So we can really focus on quality to get this right. And as a reviewer, you should really recognize when to make that trade off and tailor your feedback accordingly. Another mistake is being unkind. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we all, we've all experienced like text messaging, right? Back and forth with people. Um, a lot of context can get lost. Yeah. You can sound really mean in a text message unintentionally. I think sometimes this translates over yeah. to code reviews as well, where you're giving some feedback to somebody and maybe you yeah. sound aggressive or mean. And this kind of stuff is important, right? You don't, you don't, you could alienate your teammate um, by doing this. You could, uh, because, you, and you want to create an environment where your teammate will also listen to you. You want your teammate to listen to you, but um, you also, like when they have feedback, you want to be able to listen to them as well. And by, by leaving kind comments, then you're able to, it creates an environment where you and your teammate can more effectively work together. Um, I think not giving a reason why is a, is a common reviewer mistake. Um, sometimes you say, okay, we should change the variable name from this to this, but you should still give a reason why in that sense, right? Maybe the variable didn't yeah. match the business domain, um, or maybe the variable doesn't match the conventions with the rest of the code. Like even small nitpicks like that, they, you should still give a reason why. Um, and I think also being wrong is a common mistake. And this is, I think this is one that um, not a whole lot of people really pay attention to, but being, being wrong, like um, giving, whenever you give like feedback to somebody, um, it's okay to like ask a question to say, Hey, um, you know, should we do this? I'm not, I'm not sure, but should we do this? Um, but it's also another thing yeah. to like give them a suggestion and then just be completely wrong where you could have been right by just reading the existing code or diving into it a little bit deeper. Yeah. Because when you give feedback to somebody, you are earning credibility on your team. It's a way of, um, you know, uh, getting your teammates to trust your perspective and input. So you, so most of the time when you're commenting on a code yeah. review um, or you're giving a suggestion, you should be right. And that comes from like really understanding the change and also going back and refining the, the code review comments as you go. Um, so yeah, those are so, some common mistakes that I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I've also seen and also done such mistakes. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Career. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think the, on the last point, you know, you, you try to be correct when you're, you know, writing a review, try to be correct about your suggestion. But specifically for the junior developers, that does not mean that you should be correct. afraid of, you know, yes. writing a comment. Uh, so don't be afraid, but it's more about, you know, learning by mistakes. If you're wrong, admit it and you know next time try to be try to do better right so that's the idea but uh, so it's not about you know just uh, like being afraid of making mistakes so i'm putting this comment but does it make sense uh, or am i missing some context and i think you also shared one way where you can ask a question instead of just saying can we do this something like that or instead of saying that we can also ask maybe i might be missing some context but uh, do you think something like yes. this would also work or this is better yes. something like that? Right. So yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, anything to add? Uh, no, I think, I on? think those are absolutely great additions that you mentioned. Um, you're absolutely right. Like uh, questions are very powerful. Like not everything has to be a suggestion. Um, and even for, you mentioned yeah. the junior developer use case of like asking a question, maybe you say, you know, um, what would happen if this input value is no, like, um, or, yeah. And, or maybe as a junior developer, also a good way, like a non-blocking comment could be like, you know, why did you decide to do this mm -hmm. over this? Because code reviews are also about learning, right? When you're giving a review, you want to yeah. mentor others, but you also want to learn as well from, from the code review author. Um, and on the senior side, a good, a good opportunity to ask a question could be um, maybe to uh, not, maybe you want the author to solve some problem on their own. So for example, you see yeah. that there's a flaw, um, like a junior developer maybe missed a null check or something. And as a senior developer, you can say, hmm, what would happen if the input value is null? Just kind of like, you know, you could say that to get them to solve the problem on their own, as opposed to maybe giving them the clear path saying, hey, like this could be null, so you should change this line here. Um, 
you know, maybe you want to kind of grow them and mentor them yeah. into a, uh, uh, a more like a mid-level engineer. Absolutely. Yeah. I also believe that, you know, code reviews are a great way to also yes. mentor them, you know, asynchronously on certain areas of code base. Uh, great. It makes sense. Uh, let's talk a little bit on yeah. the nitpicking side, you know, so I, I do a lot of nitpicking. Uh, I mean, not on purpose, but you know, maybe there are some nitpicks that, that do not make, you know, a lot of like objective difference uh, to the, to the code review or to the code base but it adds some value in terms of, you know, being standardized and, you know, following yeah. the convention, for example, uh, as you also gave an example on variable name changes or uh, following a functional paradigm as compared to like imperative style because other code bases like that or uh, just creating, you know, or writing a log line yeah. a little bit differently and all these kind of nitpicks that, what do you think about nitpicks? I mean, let's say there are, it's, it's the matter of choice between author and the reviewer, how to move forward? Should we get stuck? Should we dis disagree and commit? Uh, what works in your experience? Yeah, so um, in my experience, nitpicks are extremely valuable um, because those little minor details do wonders for a code base um, as the code base grows and grows in size. Mm. Um, so to, to reduce complexity, you want to make sure you're naming things right. You want to make sure you have a consistent maybe commenting structure. You want to make sure you use similar abstractions um, because this, this does wonders for being able to maintain a code base. So nitpicks are very important. I think that um, many people nitpick in the wrong way. Like maybe they just kind of say, um, I use the example of, okay, change the variable name. Um, but instead of just saying that, like maybe give a reason behind it. So it's really important to like give a reason behind the nitpick so that the author understands and so that they don't make uh, the same mistake yeah. in the future. Um, I also like prefixing uh, nitpicks with like maybe like nitpick at the beginning of the comment or like small um, just to kind of tell them, hey, like this is uh, a small thing. I know this is not like this is not a huge thing. I'm no, I know I'm nitpicking here. I know this is a very small thing, but it could really improve the code base if, if we do this. Um, and most of the time, like GitHub has a uh, comments and approve option. So like if I only have nitpicks on the code review, um, then I'll leave my nitpick comments and then I'll approve the, the code review, you know, trusting that the author will go ahead and make those minor minor fixes before merging um, into the, the, uh, the main code base. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, where does pair programming fits into all this, you know? Uh, so I've, I've talked to some of the pair yeah. programming advocates and I also believe yeah. that it is powerful to do pair programming, but it needs some, you know, that culture in the team that, you know, everyone feels, uh, you know, okay to do the yeah. pair programming style. Uh, but where our discussion fits uh, well, like what parts of our discussion might also be relevant to pair programming? Uh, and what are you- Yeah, so- Different different teams should use what works for them, right? Um, my my yeah. code review course and a lot of my content around code reviews isn't really a an argument for or against like pair pair programming. Like I don't really have the discussion of pair programming pair programming versus code reviews too often because I think teams should do what yeah. works for them. Yeah. Um, most of my content is around like. Uh, you know, if you're participating in a pull request style of code review process, you know, this is how you can do it well and do it effectively. Um, but I think, but in terms of pair programming in general, I think pair programming is an outstanding and effective tool, um, especially for mentoring or putting your heads together um, to, uh, you know, come up with the best possible solution to a code base. I think a lot of teams um, that yeah. work in an agile way find it, find it really effective. Um, whereas it doesn't work for some other companies because, you know, you have two head, you have two developers that are like, you know, putting their heads towards this, uh, the same, uh, task, right. That means a lot of tasks are stalled in the process, um, which is not a big deal for a lot of these agile focused teams, but on some of these other, um, teams that just operate in a different way, um, sometimes that can be unproductive. So a lot of those teams favor asynchronous code reviews. But pair, pair programming is a very effective tool. It, it's, it's, I don't think it's a, it's a choice between one or the other. Um, I think they're tools that complement each other. Uh, pair, pair programming and code reviews, they're tools yeah. that complement each other. Um, and, you know, teams should do what's best for them. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, totally, I mean, I don't have a lot of experience in pair programming. I've done it like very minimal in my experience, but yes, I also believe that, you know, it is powerful and there's no this versus that, but there's like what works best for your use case yep. and that, that should be followed. So great, let's move to a little practical part and like more interesting part where, you know, uh, we talk about sure. some practical examples. So the examples that we are going to share is, you know, inspired by some of my experience and also just a bit of Googling, like some random uh, PR review comments that I found very interesting. And we'll try to classify each of those comments in a, in a code review into three classes, like good, uh, average, and bad. And we'll also talk a bit about, you know, how we can improve them or why it is good. Okay. So here is our first example, which is, you know, uh, so the comment is, this is not how we do it. Please change it from right. A to B. Yeah, this is a, this is a pretty interesting first example. Um, so earlier I talked about um, some of the documentation that, um, that should be included in the team level code review guidelines. And I mentioned certain subjective yeah. Um, principles that teams should take a stance on, you know, in terms of dry or in terms of function abstraction, those kinds of things. Um, ideally, these types of things yeah. would be documented. And if if they are, so assuming that they are documented, um, then this would be, I would classify this as a good comment. Um, maybe it would be better if the reviewer could maybe hyperlink the documentation um, because, you know, you could say, or maybe add some details about like, this is not how we do it because of this reason and maybe link some documentation saying that. Um, and then the second part of the comment, please change it from A to B. Um, I do like that the reviewer has given a clear path forward to the author um, saying like, you know, this is, this is what, this is what I would suggest. Um, maybe please change it. You know, the, I like the word, please like it's, it is, it's using mannerisms. It's use, it's being kind. Um, maybe, uh, in yeah. certain situations, I might say, oh, I recommend changing it from A to B because of this reason. Um, so, but overall, I would, I would say this comment yeah. is good provided all that background information is there. Makes sense. Awesome. Uh, great. Let's talk about the second one. So it says, I'm not sure, but would this be better if we do this instead of that? So it's a, it's more, more yeah, like a um, I would, I like this one as well. Um, so asking questions that are, you know, I, I kind of mentioned that I like to ask questions if I'm mentoring a, a junior engineer um, and, uh, or asking questions to get the author to consider something like maybe I don't have time to dive super deep into, um, uh, you know, what would be the impact of my suggestion. Um, so maybe I ask you a question, hey, have you considered yeah. this? Um, and I think those are, those are good. Um, I think as long as like, maybe if this is the only comment on the pull request, um, you want to make sure like once they answer that yeah. question, you want to make sure that you get back to them fast. Cause you don't want to, you know, maybe ask this question and say, Hey, would it be better if we did this instead of that? Then they answer you. And then like their PR is just blocked for like a day or something. <laughs> like Just like get back to yeah. this fast. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it boils down to, you know, setting clear paths and be responsive yes. once you have asked this question. Uh, great. So this is also like... Yes, good I would program, classify right? this as good. Yes. There's nothing bad about it. Awesome. Uh, the third one. In my opinion, this won't work and may introduce nasty bugs. Could you please... Sure. So this? I would classify this comment as bad. Um, and so first of all, it's, it's an objective comment, right? Um, so they're saying, okay, in my opinion... This yeah. won't work and it'll introduce nasty bugs. If it doesn't work, you know, it doesn't work. That's not an, that's not a subjective um, discussion, right? This is an objective discussion. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you don't have to say in my opinion, but the code change will cause nasty bugs, right? Um, that's kind of vague. Yeah. There isn't a whole lot of um, specificity into what kinds of bugs it will cause. And so because of that, there isn't a good yeah. reason why. Um, behind the comment. So if the comment would say, okay, this code would cause a bug for this reason, then the author would more likely yeah. understand, you know, why, what, what kinds of bugs would be caused and why, why they would cause them. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah I, it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I Sorry, wanted to add that, I um, you know, the, the question afterwards, could you please rewrite this? 
um, pro- it would probably be more productive to give a, a clear path forward and to like, or make a suggestion about how they could rewrite it or restructure it. Exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, great. The, the next one. I like this solution, but I think we can do it this way. I feel this way is better because I think this uh, this is a good uh, good comment. Um, good example of a good comment gives a um, gives a reason why, and it also gives a clear path forward. Um, yeah, definitely a good comment. Yeah, yes, because there, there's some uh, context and some recommendation like how yes. you, you you would do that. Great. So this does not block the author, so it makes sense. Uh, the next one, you have changed this code, which is unrelated to the ticket you're working on. Yeah. So Everybody this is, um, I would say this is so, so, um, because I think it's good to call out, um, unrelated changes, but I think it's even better and more productive to kind of have it in those team level code review guidelines. This is one of the very common contention points that teams yeah. have. Okay. Are, can we make minor incremental refactorings within a code review? Is it okay to have unrelated incremental refactorings yeah. or do we always pull that out into a separate pull request? Yeah. Um, so something that should be decided on the team. Yeah. Absolutely. I think if if we just remove the please word from it, it might right. become a little on yes. the bad side, right? Yes. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> okay. Great. So the next example, can you please add a test which asserts... Um, I like this one. Um, I think uh, it's... It's a the primary primary objective of code reviews is to find those flaws, find those defects, and I think, um, you know, a, asking for a, a another test case is very reasonable. Yeah, absolutely, great. Uh, the next one, uh, please make this log line better. I would re- write something like order number, customer number, and so it's also giving a suggestion. Uh, I like this one. Like um, I think. Uh, Please make this log line better. Um, might sound a little bit of like a command, um, but I think yeah. stuff like this should be um, like there should be a reason here. So actually, I would actually I would classify this as yeah. in the bad category, um, specifically because mm. maybe it's so so. <laughs> okay, yeah, I would give so so. Not completely yeah. bad because they're saying you know they're using manners yeah. and. Um, you know, giving a clear path forward. But um, the one thing that's missing here is like a reason yeah. why. So, um, you know, the log line, you know, reason. that's yeah. the the um, the format here is definitely a good way to log information. But why is that a good way to log information? And does the rest of the code yeah. base do it? Um, then that would be a good Absolutely. reason. Yeah. Yeah. We could say something like, could you please make this uh, log line something like this? Yep. Because this will help debugging. Uh, we use order IDs or customer number yes. very often while we debug and something like that. So adding yeah. a reason makes makes a lot of sense there. Great. Uh, the the next one and the last one. I'm not sure why more and more developers are using this style, but yeah. I don't think it makes sense. <laughs> so I would say I would say this is a bad one. Um, <laughs> I think uh, in general I try to avoid style discussions entirely in code reviews. You know there are plenty of pre-commit tools, auto formatters, yeah. auto linters that can just make sure your code is of the right style. Um, just take get rid of all those discussions altogether. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. So I think these examples might give a lot more practical insights into our discussion to our viewers. So I think it makes sense. And the I think the idea is like, with respect, you have to give the suggestion, you have to tell the reason why you're suggesting something like that. And uh, the, it's best to give some actionable insights into it, right? So they can work on it and not just block them. And also when you're reviewing the PR or, or the uh, code, it's best to be responsive so right. they are not blocked on something, right? And uh, so, yes, I think we have covered pretty good points here. And I think it will add a lot of value to people who are new to code reviewing as a process, uh, to the teams who, who don't have very standard process and they, you know, face this issue of, you know, slowing down uh, the, uh, the deliverables and, you know, the process and uh, people who have a process, but they feel that it takes a lot of time for them to, you know, even approach a code review. So I think our discussion is going to add a lot of value. So thanks a lot, Curtis, for coming to the episode. And uh, I'll also link the uh, the blogs that you have shared, 
uh, your Twitter, your LinkedIn, and about your course in the comment section. So our viewers can actually go take a look, read the testimonials. And if it's relevant for you, if, if this is what you want to learn, uh, go for it. So okay. thanks a lot, Curtis. Yes. I, I hope you all I very much enjoyed this discussion, <laughs> KV. I really appreciate you having me on the podcast. And I think we covered a lot of ground here, um, talking about a very important topic, uh, code reviews. And I uh, really like everything you're doing with the podcast. This was an outstanding and fun experience and a great conversation. Awesome.